<laughs> okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order at 4.33, the Chetwin District uh, Council. So they called the meeting to order and we will be calling to order the meeting and we will have the opening statement read by as we begin our meeting this evening, we reflect on the service we provide to our citizens and we will endeavor to conduct our business effectively and productively on their behalves. Thank you. Thank you. Adoption of the agenda. So moved. Is there any new items? <laughs> it's our new EK, 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 yeah. EK, EKG machine or whatever. Min it minutes EK. of the regular meeting held on June 3rd, 2019. Motion to receive. All those discussion? Uh, uh, something Avery? Done. Yes, Mel. Um, just in regards to the comments made by Sarah Hohen, uh, from the um, who works at the uh, BC service, um, Due to the sensitive issues addressed at the service BC building meeting rooms, I don't think it was an unreasonable request made to have a visual barrier set up between there and the new cannabis store. That's it. If I can just say, Janet, there is actually a building between the two buildings, but I'm sure you're aware of that now. So you mean more? There's, more there's of a building and then there's a garage in the back and I don't think it would be very costly or I just thought it was, I didn't think it was an unreasonable request. Any more discussion on the minutes from uh, June 3rd? Okay, need a motion to accept the minutes? Okay, let's vote on Accept? Okay. Accept. <clears throat> just in, in. Mm -hmm. The adoption for the public uh, hearing uh, mil minutes held on June 3rd, 2019. I'll make that motion. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Carried. Okay, on to delegation. We have Dave Conaway and Nancy Pepper from BC Hydro, Site C. Dave, welcome. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and appreciate the opportunity today uh, for yourself and Council to make a presentation to you and to provide an update in regards to where the Site C project presently stands. And uh, for Council, Your Worship, uh, this came out of the conversation that uh, you and I had in Fort St. John, I believe, which was at one of the Regional Community Liaison Committee meetings. So we're following up on that, and I thank you for the opportunity. Um, the, the Site C project, I think we're missing a slide here. We need to back up a bit. We have a cover slide, Kevin. I uh, yeah, the first slide that speaks to the overall project cost. Next slide. Oh, can I? Okay. Ah, there we go. Okay, I thought I got everything done for myself when I showed up. <laughs> Obviously not. Um, so you, you'll see that uh, the project present spend of three point five billion dollars. Uh, this was as of March 31, 2019. The overall project cost commitments, which includes the $3.5 billion spend, is actually $6.6 .6 billion. This includes impact benefit agreements that we have with Indigenous communities as well as the Peace River Legacy Fund and mitigation agreements that we have with impacted communities within the district. We're getting close to uh, four years of construction. We're about three and three quarter years in. We started July 2015. And 
I wanted to note that a river diversion is a key milestone for us. River diversion will occur in late fall, pardon me, a late summer, early fall of 2020. And that's a key milestone date for us. We need to hit river diversion. If we don't do that before winter load picks up, then there's too much water in the river, then we're going to be back. Uh, we're going to be delayed a year, and that has uh, cost implications as well. So with that comes the closure of the Peace River. So I wanted to note that this will be the last full year of recreational opportunity on the Peace River where you could transit between the Peace Island boat launch near uh, South Taylor all the way through uh, past the site and up to the Halfway River temporary launch up to Hudson Hope. So we're wanting to get the word out to everybody um, that the river will be closed in the spring of 2020 when we put some debris booms in the river. Um, the project cost is $10.7 billion total. Uh, first generator and turbine will be online in early 2024, and there's six generators and turbines. They'll all be online by the end of 2024, and the project is completed in 2025 with site remediation. Okay, now, now we're good, Kevin. Thank you. This, is a, this video is a... a project, that, uh, pardon me, is a video that shows you how the project's actually constructed. I want to show you this because it'll make more sense when you see the actual photographs of what's going on on the ground. The Site C Clean Energy Project is a hydroelectric dam and generating station on the Peace River, seven kilometers southwest of Fort St. John. Located downstream of BC Hydro's two existing hydroelectric facilities, Site C will use water already stored behind the WAC Bennett Dam to produce 35% of the energy of the Bennett Dam with a reservoir 5% of the size of the Williston Reservoir. Safety is a key consideration in the project design. Site C will be constructed and maintained in accordance with International and Canadian Dam Association safety practices. It meets current seismic safety and environmental guidelines. In addition to the dam and generating station, the Site C project scope includes transmission lines, the realignment of up to 30 kilometers of Highway 29, the upgrade of several public roads that access the dam site, and shoreline protection measures at Hudson's Hope. Construction activities start with preparing the dam site. The site is cleared and access roads are constructed. A lodge is built for workers. Temporary construction bridges are built across the Peace River and Moberly River. Excavation and slope stabilization of the north bank above the dam site begins. After site preparation, substation construction begins, along with clearing for two new 500 kV transmission lines that will connect Site C to the existing Peace Canyon Generating Station. The first step in building the dam is to build coffer dams on the north and south banks to confine the river. This allows for construction activities to begin behind the coffer dams. Following completion of the south bank coffer dam, work begins on a large concrete buttress that supports the valley wall. The buttress provides a foundation for the generating station, gated spillway and auxiliary spillway. After completion of the slope stabilization on the north bank, work then begins on two diversion tunnels, which eventually will be used to divert the river around the dam site to allow for construction of the center portion of the Earthfill Dam in the main river channel. Construction of the north and south portions of the Earthfill Dam begins, as does construction of the powerhouse, power intakes, and penstocks atop the completed segment of the powerhouse buttress. Installation of the turbines and generators also begins. The substation and one 500 kV transmission line is completed. Once the tunnels are opened to enable diversion of the river, work to complete the upstream and downstream coffer dams is carried out and the river is diverted through the diversion tunnels to allow construction of the central portion of the Earthfill Dam to begin. Upon completion of the spillway buttress, work on the spillway structure begins. The spillway is an important safety feature that allows the passage of large volumes of water from the reservoir when high inflows exceed the discharge capabilities of the generating units. 
Spills are expected to occur very infrequently. An auxiliary spillway is also constructed, which enhances safety so that even if the generating station loses all power, it can safely pass the upstream flows until power can be restored to the facility. Work on the Earthfill Dam continues in parallel with construction of the approach channel, which carries water from the reservoir to the power intakes and spillway. The third and final buttress segment, the dam buttress, and work on the intake structure is completed. Work on the spillway structure continues in parallel with the start of construction for the three 500 kV transmission lines that connect the powerhouse to the substation and the second 500 kV transmission line that connects to Peace Canyon is completed. Once the Earthfill Dam and spillway are complete, the reservoir is filled over a period of approximately three to four months. After reservoir filling, the diversion tunnels are permanently plugged and backfilled. The reservoir will be, on average, two to three times the width of the current river. With the reservoir in place, the first turbine generator unit can be commissioned and connected to the substation to start producing electricity, with the remaining five units coming into service sequentially. Site C will provide 1100 megawatts of capacity and about 5100 gigawatt hours of energy annually. That's enough energy to power the equivalent of about 450,000 homes per year in BC. Once complete, the Site C project will provide clean, reliable and affordable electricity for more than 100 years. To learn more, visit SiteCProject.com. So that gives you an overview of how the project is constructed and I'm going to uh, go into a little more detail here. And <clears throat> so you, you've got the information about the project. The view here is we're looking uh, from left to right, we're looking upstream towards Hudson Hope. The river on our left is the Moberly. So the facility is located just below the confluence of the Peace and the Moberly rivers. This is the South Bank side. Um, substation is on the South Bank side. And uh, there's your powerhouse, there's your dual power spillway and your passive spillway. Dam is 1,050 meters across, 60 meters up from the riverbed. Water comes up 50 meters, and then it goes in a, a, like a door wedge, thick on the dam end, thins out all the way back to the tail race of the Peace Canyon Dam. That's 83 kilometers. So we're capturing all the head over 83 kilometers, all the elevation drop. So from a business update perspective, um, as of the uh, end of March of 2019, there were approximately 340 uh, local regional businesses working on the project. This is the breakdown of where those businesses are located. You see the bulk of those are around Fort St. John. There were 12 in Chet Chetwind, 26 in Dawson. These numbers have dropped a little bit since our previous report out, Your Worship. You may recall we were up in the 400 range at that time. These are all the contracts that have been awarded to date. I won't run through them all. I used to because there were only a couple on the list. Almost all the major contracts have been awarded. There's only a few outstanding ones of large significance. Um, one of those is the generating station and spillway. That's what the GSS stands for. Balance of plant and that's the infrastructure within inside the powerhouse, the control, um, the control equipment in the powerhouse. And we have a short list. It went out to request for proposals. There is a short list, and we expect to select the preferred proponent in uh, early 2021. Uh, future procurements, we are procuring sections of Highway 29, and those are done through the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. These are the latest employment statistics we have. We lag about six weeks behind because we've got to collect the data from our prime contractors who collect it from our subcontractors, and then we have to actually analyze the data. So you'll notice in April, our workforce is 3775. Uh, 2950 of those people are from British Columbia, and just over 600 were from the regional district, the Peace River Regional District. So um, from a con construction perspective, there are approximately th just over 3,000 people working on the construction and environmental side of the project. 
and 2305 are from, B, from BC, so 75% of the workforce is from British Columbia. Overall for the project, 91% of the project is from BC. And this gives you a view of those numbers in perspective to the, to the previous year. So you can see our most recent numbers at 3775 surpassed our peak from last September. That's normally where we reach the peak for the season before we start to drop off. There's some activities you can only do during the non-freezing months. And that's things like ro putting down the roller compacted concrete. Last year's peak, 3746. Um, BC residents, you can see they reflect the drop, so they mirror the drop. And the Peace River Regional District numbers, uh, slight mirror as well, but been fairly consistent in number. Indigenous workers on the project and women. So there were just under 400 women working on the project in April and 283 Indigenous workers. There's a larger percentage of the Indigenous workers doing the clearing work. So if we have, uh, for example, Forever Green doing work for us. Um, and a lot of that work, you lose the workers when, of course, the roads break up and the ground's not frozen. You've got to wait for everything to dry out before you can get back in again. So that's why you see a bit of a drop off there. We promote local opportunities through a number of spots. We, we try to push everything to our contractors as much as possible. Um, off of our website, because it's the contractors who are doing the majority of the hiring, it's not BC Hydro directly. And their addresses are all on, on our web. Um, if companies are looking for contracts that aren't coming through the prime contractors, those contractors are listed by us on uh, BC Bid. And we have a business directory. We ask people to sign up in the business directory so that the primes know what local businesses are available and what resources, services, or uh, supplies that they can provide. So this is a picture of our website. Um, we've had over 10,000 inquiries related to the project since we began construction at the end of July in 2015. 90% of those inquiries are about jobs and business opportunities. So it's about 75% jobs and about 15% business opportunities. The remaining 10% is about general inquiries about the project, project complaints or statements of support or opposition. So that's that remaining 10%. But the lion's share is business and job opportunities. And so you can see right at the top of the heading, business. Jobs, and that's where we direct people to. So the construction update for you. This is the North Bank side that you're looking at. And on the top is the work location. You'll see down here, there's a coffer dam. This is the inlet portal coffer dam, and here's the two diversion tunnels. Farther downstream, there's an outlet coffer dam right in here. And the outlet tunnels are right there. This is the main, when we say left bank, because it's as you're looking downstream, left-hand side, right-hand side, or north bank, south bank. This is the left, this is the left bank coffer dam. So the coffer dam protect the work areas because we're working below the river elevation. And in fact, this picture doesn't show it right now, but we're going down and we're, tr we're doing trenching activities, and we're about 35 meters below the river elevation. And so the coffer dam actually has a slurry that's put in the middle of it. It goes right down to bedrock and it seals off the area from the river so the water can't leak underneath. And the areas are, are remain dry for working. This slope is a north bank slope and you may have heard we had a tension crack. The tension crack was located right around here. That would have been uh, about three years ago now. And we've moved 11 to 12 million cubic meters of material off of the north bank, which was planned and it's dispersed in different areas around the site. And that's to keep those materials away from where the dam is going to be. So you're going to have the river diverted here, it's going to exit down here, and the dam is being constructed right in here. This flat top, that's the start of the upside of the dam. And the dam will adhere to the surface right in here. We're working in shale bedrocks. Oop, I'm going to back up a second. So, I can't see it on the screen. The construction bridge from the north side to the south side is located in here. It's a temporary structure. Our certification only allows it to remain in place for our construction needs, and then it has to come out. 
This is a road header. The road header is used to construct the diversion tunnels. And the, this is the uh, one of the two tunnels. The tunnels are 750 to 800 meters long. They do the top portion of the tunnel first. They call it the header. And then they come back and they do the bottom portion, the bench. They'll be 11 meters in diameter. And then once the actual mining of the 11 meter tunnels is done, they actually put in a concrete lining. And we expect to start that work, if not this week, next week. And in the next few weeks, we expect the two portions of the tunnels, because we're working on the outlet end and the inlet end, working to, get, to come together. And we expect the tunnel breakthrough to occur in the next few weeks. This is a powerhouse unit one, and it's the coupling chamber. This is where the penstocks join the powerhouse on the south bank side. Your view here is the spillway excavation, and we're kind of at the base of the spillway looking up towards the escarpment. This is on the south side. And you can see the top of the escarpment right along here. This is a panoramic view at the top of the, uh, the powerhouse buttress, looking at the powerhouse construction that's going on, and you can see the view across the river to the north bank. This is a shot from a drone looking down onto the powerhouse. And you can see uh, to the right of the screen is the spillway excavation work. Right in there. And this is the approach channel work that's going on. This is the uh, substation located on the south bank. We're at, looking at the 500,000 uh, volt portion of the switchyard. The switchyard will be the largest switchyard that BC Hydro has in BC when it's completed. So it'll have 500,000 volts in it, 230, 230,000 volts, which is for the new Prez line, Peace River Electricity Supply, and then the local service to Taylor and Fort St. John, which is 138,000 volts. And you can just see on the top right-hand side of the escarpment, the right-of-way that's going up. So that's, that's the portion coming out of the sub to join the existing right-of-way. So there's an overview for you. So you have the spillway abutment, the powerhouse work, the, the spillways here, the powerhouse abutment, you have um, Peace River Hydro Partners batch plant on the top. Close up view of the completed powerhouse buttress. All the materials, almost all the materials needed to build the dam are coming from site. So this is an ancient riverbed. There's lots of gravels in here. The gravels are being sorted crushed and the materials will be used to build the earth filled dam. So you start with a, a very fine impermeable core and then you build a shell outward to protect that until you get to very large rock, the riprap, to protect the upstream side. AFDE, who's our generating station and spillways contractor, that's the GSS, this is their concrete batch plant. So this is more conventional concrete. And this is the riprap rock that's coming out of the West Pine Quarry, just past the rest area in the Pine Pass. MOTI had an existing quarry there. The rock is, uh, there's a rail line and the uh, rock is being moved by rail. As you're aware, it's coming through the community. Comes to a siding up by the project Septimus siding where it's offloaded. It's either placed down for the coffer dams or it's being stored for the actual uh, dam itself or the diversion coffer dams when they're put in place. This is one of the components for the penstocks. It's a spiral case. They're being manufactured on site. So pieces will come in. You can see the three pieces there. They're actually joined, shaped, and welded on site. And then they're transported to the location where they will be uh, fitted in. This is one of the transition pieces. You'll notice that this view we have is square. There's four of these pieces. They're put together. The, the back end of it, you can't see it is round. So this is for the intakes, and there'll be six pieces like this. Square on the intake side, and then round into the penstock. And this is the pieces being assembled on site. This is the transmission line being constructed. So you'll have two transmission lines with towers that look like these. This occurred this winter. And I put this in because you can see a number of the towers uh, in line together. We got 54 of them up this year. We just got another 400 to go. So, so a little bit of work to do. 
And off to the left here, you can see the existing transmission lines. These are 138 kV transmission lines. These come from the WAC Bennett Dam, and one of the lines runs to Taylor, and the other line runs to Fort St. John, so it's local service. This is a photo of the till conveyor. So we have these impermeable materials for the center of the dam. They're coming from a piece of property just south of Fort St. John in the regional district. So you can see the city here. And these lands right here we reference as the 85th Avenue industrial lands. And the till conveyor will move them five kilometers from those lands to here and then turn south down to the project. We're doing uh, fish habitat enhancement work, so we're contouring some of the back channels. At low water, the uh, back channels are stranded. And back channels are where uh, young fish, the fry, uh, they grow there before they move into the mainstream. So it's one of the things we're doing to mitigate the project's impacts on fish. And, was, and the debris is there in place because the fish use that for protection. I'm told that this is the largest undertaking for fish habitat in ever in the province of British Columbia, and apparently we suspect it's the largest ever undertaken in Western Canada. Uh, we have uh, two of the 500,000 volt line towers here at Peace Canyon. These are the gantries, and this is the Peace Canyon substation. So the 500 KV lines will come into the Peace Canyon substation and then they'll join the existing line to go down through the Pine Pass, past Prince George, the lower mainland. You've got a worker here checking out some of the gas insulated equipment. And I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague Nancy Pepper to talk about the community mitigation programs. Thank you, Dave. You're too tall. Uh, this is our hot off the presses rendering of what the Lynx Creek boat launch will look like. So this launch, the current launch is just west of Lynx Creek currently. This is the rendering of what the new launch will look like. It has a double wide ramp to make it easier to put your boat in and out if maybe you're not the best at backing up. Uh, it should accommodate parking for about 30 to 36 trucks and trailers. As you can see, there's a vehicle entering and a vehicle exiting on opposite sides to help control traffic. There's an area where you can stop, pull off to the side, unhook your boat before pulling up to the ramp so that you can launch faster. And then on the opposite side of the parking lot, there'll be an area for you to pull away from the ramp, park your truck, um, reattach all of your chains and lines so that you can safely drive away. There'll also be an outhouse and a small picnic area at the, at the day launch. As well as the Lakes Creek boat launch replacement, there will also be a small craft launch located at the bottom of the A. Thomas Road, which is also called the Old Ferry Landing there in Hudson's Hope. So that will consist of a gangway and boats that you can launch car hopper type boats, canoes, kayaks, and also a small day use area with picnic tables, an outhouse, more parking, things like that. So that would be another amenity that we would in. And finally, the Cash Creek boat launch will be very similar to the Lake Street boat launch with a double wide trailer that will be located down towards the Port St. John end of the valley. In addition to the boat launches, as you know, we provided $200,000 in funding to Chequin to develop a recreation site of your choice. I understand from your staff that you're just waiting back to hear about a potential location. Uh, we did work together to extend the term on which that money could be spent, so we've extended that by an extra to 2021, so lots of time. Uh, the other program that we have starting soon that your staff will receive an information package on in the next few weeks is our rustic recreation site fund. When we were doing the environmental assessment, we assessed the very kind of small rustic sites where maybe there would be an outhouse, maybe a picnic table, a fire room type of sites to see how many there were. And then we proposed a small fund to help new groups develop new sites. So local governments are eligible to apply, nonprofit voting groups would be eligible to apply, and also indigenous groups would be eligible to apply. So this is separate from the boat launches and everything else that BC Hydro is doing. This is just to replace those small kind of rustic sites that I know a lot of folks in the area like having a, 
of the space that is in true development and just get out and follow those. So we'll have an information package out in the next few weeks. The grants will be for up to $10,000 per site. And it'll also, the site would need to be permitted through um, Recreation and Trails BC, similar to other sites that are developed right now. Uh, the section 55s and 56 applications need to be completed as well. There will also be an additional $100,000 that will be made available once the reservoir is created to fund, again, small rustic sites along the reservoir once it's built. This is for areas outside our project zone to develop our recreation opportunities for folks while we're still under construction. The BC Hydro Peace Agricultural Fund is also well underway. The board will be holding their first public meeting on July 5th in Fort St. John in the afternoon. You should see advertisements out for that in just another week or two in Alaska Highway, Energetic City, and in the Gossip area. We're also continuing our annual traffic monitoring of two intersections here in Chetland to ensure that we stay within the parameters that we um, that were evaluated during our environmental assessment. And to date, under the community agreement that we've signed with Chetland, we've also provided $150,000 in funding to support the district in interacting with BC Hydro and coming to all those sites and meetings that you do get invited to. One of the other great initiatives that we have is the Go Fund, which of course several of your counselors have, been, have served on. Uh, so far, these are the organizations in Chetland that have received funding. There's been a bit over $300,000 distributed so far, and that's overseen by a regional decision making board with one counselor from each community and then one community member as well. And then I'll hand this back to Dave. So there's a number of ways that we're keeping people informed about the project. Of course, local government, we have a regional community liaison committee. Um, and more than happy, we have hosted council to site before. Uh, and we try to do that with another advisory group that BC Hydro has, the East Coast Advisory Committee. Um, but we're using all of today's uh, social platforms. So we we actually have a Facebook, uh, we don't have a Facebook site, pardon me. Um, we use uh, our web page, which is sightseeproject.com. We're using uh, Twitter, and we're putting out regular updates there. And people can contact us through all of these means, plus our 1877 number, emailing us directly to, to the project, and they can sign up for project updates as well. We also put out a bi-weekly construction bulletin that tells you exactly what we're working on and what we expect the potential impact for that work will be. If you're not signed up, I would encourage you to do it, and anybody can sign up for the, for the bulletin. If you find it's not useful, we can drop you off at two. So that goes up to over 7,000 people now. We're going to have that over two. And that concludes the portion of the presentation. We have one remaining video, which is a drone video that was shot at the end of May, beginning of June. So this is, some of those photos are a little bit, you don't do that. But this is the latest footage.
Worship, that concludes our presentation. I know we're at the extent of our time, but at Council's pleasure, we're available to answer some questions for you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I will entertain the thought of any questions for Robin uh, Sadu. I, I don't actually have a question. I just have a comment. That was a great presentation, Dave. Thank you. And I uh, very much appreciate it. So, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I have a question. The 20% uh, PRD, I know Bob, myself, uh, as director of the PRD and uh, uh, director Rose have uh, stated to uh, Mr. McKenzie that we thought 26% uh, was low of each of the regional district uh, employees and 20 is getting uh, quite low. So I know uh, you're going to hire at least another 500 when you need this uh, meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's uh, one of the points that I would like to make. And then the other one was what I found uh, interesting when the, the question was asked. Uh, what do you do with the diversion diversion tunnels after uh, their life is done? Right. Uh, so just a comment related to your first statement, Your Worship. Uh, we'd love to see as many people as possible in front of the region working on the project. So I know our clients try to do that. And so we certainly would love to see an additional 500 plus. So don't know where that will go. Uh, related to the diversion tunnels, um, the diver diversion tunnels are plug ones to complete when well, there's no longer need, and we need them to be imperfect. Well, the last thing we need is water uh, leaking through with a diversion tunnel used to be. So they'll be plugged out, they'll no longer be usable once the dam is in place with the turbines and spillways ready to move the water. Okay, with that, uh, any more questions? You guys want to do the safety thing? How uh, was the uh, safety uh, thought about when you uh, let uh, some of the water go from the main down to the WAC bend down? How does that affect you guys both uh, let the spillways out from both dams? Because I know when we get hot, high water marks, uh, do we have the idea of letting water go from one dam, like the big dam, to the peaks and then to to uh, Sun C? Okay. So, uh, Your Worship, if I understand correctly, you're asking once the facility is in place. Yes. Okay. So, the anything that the, the WAC Bennett Dam is the is the head body of the dog, right? Anything that is released from WAC Bennett has to be released through the other facilities. So, we have a finite ability in regards to how much water we can put through the turbines in WAC. And that's 70,000 cubic feet a second through the turbines, or 1,980 cubic meters a second through the, that's the same number, but it becomes natural variables in area. Anything more than that, if the reservoir becomes too full and the facility reaches its upper elevation of 2,205 feet in elevation, we will be split, we would have to spill that water through the WAC bed down. The second that happens, then anything that is spilled there has to, it has to go through the turbines below and the spillway at East Canyon. And then 75, 80 kilometers downstream, the same thing will happen at Site C. It'll, all the water will be going through the turbines as much as we can, and the rest of the water will go through the dual powered spillway at Site C. If the dual powered site, the spillway at Site C would fail, there's a passive auxiliary spillway that was referenced in the first video. What happens is the water gets to a certain elevation, over pops into the auxiliary spillway. And those spillways, the site C ones, are, will be some of the largest in our entire system because they have to handle everything that the WEC Bennett dam can go through and the halfway river. And I will draw your attention to an event you're all well aware of, the 2011 major rain event that washed out the Pine Pass on the rail line. And there were just about 2,000 cubic meters a second coming out of the halfway river. So we have to be able to handle everything from the halfway and anything that could happen with a full reservoir. So the spillways are that large that they can't handle that volumes. Now we're not, as a cycle, uh, overly concerned about the overly the flows of the overly during that 2011 event. We're about 120 to 150 cubic meters a second, so we're not very large floating, but a half a river is. So large, large spillways that have to handle those flows. 
Does that address your question, Your Worship? Yes. Hey, thanks, David. Thank you. With that, uh, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Dave and Nancy, for your presentation. And could I thank you that in the winter here? We need some uh, entertainment in the. <laughs> No, I just need some more updates when when the numbers are down in the winter. Absolutely. Uh, I'll give you a new like, and if you don't mind, can you give us another presentation? I appreciate the opportunity, and worship. We would be more than happy to do that, and uh, we'll set that up with uh, staff for the district. But once again, the worship council, thank you very much for the time. You know, we need a large chunk of your time tonight, and we do really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about the update. Thank you. Reports. I've got the uh, mayor's report, CR three. And 
and people within our sector of mining industry of the issues, opportunities that exist with coal mining in, the, in northern BC. Two, two years ago, Ellen McBain made the first inquiry about the hosting Minerals North, and she, she has been the face of Minerals North uh, since 2019. Thanks especially to Ellen, but we also know that this is a community effort extending well beyond City Hall into the community, drawing on local suppliers, sponsors, organizations, and volunteers. I trust Minerals North 2019 live up to Chapman's expectations and showcasing its capacity for the mining industry and confirming Chapman's ability to organize large-scale events. Congratulations, Chapman, and uh, thank you, Ellen, and thank you for the staff for uh, uh, getting behind Ellen, and uh, thank Council for all, all you've done at Minerals North by uh, introducing all the speakers and uh, making sure that we all were participating. So thank you very much. And uh, and one other note, uh, the Chainsaw Carvings went very well. And uh, that's another event that uh, Chapman is uh, proud of. And that I, I take great part, pride in. I mention that everywhere I go in uh, the piece and outside of the piece. So uh, we should be very proud of our little uh, community. Uh, once again, thanks, Ellen, and uh, thanks, staff. And, uh, we will continue with the uh, administration administrators with part of the you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you read this one. <laughs> oh, I would like to be able to see the answer if anyone had any questions. Okay. Any questions for an administrator? Do we have to receive your report? Or does it not? It's optional. Okay. Oh, right. Okay, we don't want to. <laughs> yeah. I just had a question on yes. parks. Uh, so we're all done our play parks now? Put the play structures? No, not quite yet. We have one more year. And then after that, we'll have to maintain as necessary. Oh, I see. Do we have a motion? Yes. Yeah. Second. 
You second it. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Okay. For Sid Kimple, the University of BC, upcoming events, 2019 Union of British Columbia Municipal Convention. Make recommendation that council authorize all members of the council to attend the Union of BC Municipalities 2019 Convention, September 23rd to 27th, 2019, in Vancouver, BC. Second that. Discussion. All those in favor? Carry. Okay, correspondence. Does anybody see anything here that jumps out at them? Uh, I don't like to see one poll. Okay, see so one. <clears throat> Any further? Just see one. Can I make a motion? Can we have a motion to accept all others other than C1? No, no, so no, 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 Um, so I just have a couple questions um, on it. In, um, I'll, first of all, I'll start taking you to um, financial statement presentation issues. It says during the course of the audit, we concluded the district had not adopted Section PPS 3260 liability for contamination sites of the public sector accounting board handbook, which has resulted in the qualification of auditors as part of the game this year. Can you just explain what that is? So. Yeah, um, section PS3260 says that we are supposed to evaluate all of our sites and recognize any sites that are potentially contaminated and what liability we would have to clean those sites up. We have uh, been in a constant fluctuation back in the engineering department where this review was, was going on. So we're partway through the work to get that done. We just haven't finalized it yet. And we wanted to avoid hiring contractors for it. There, it's not anticipated there's going to be a lot there, but it's part of the handbook section. We're going to be up ready for it in October when we're back for the intern. So then I have another question under um, recommendations. No. Um, okay. Oh. Oh, sure, okay. thank you. Sorry. Um, under transfers, um, it says during the audit we noted that a few inter fund transfers were not officially approved by council. Can you give me an example of what that would be? Yeah, um, what you're referring to is there were a couple of transfers from the one that I'll give you as an easy example. It was, it was approved by motion of council, but without a number. Uh, and what council had done was council had said that any excess land lease revenue we obtained from leasing of the property down to the airport, we were going to transfer to a debt retirement reserve. I made that transfer for the resolution, but council didn't make a motion that said transfer X number of dollars to the reserve. I just didn't bring it back to you for a further follow up on it. That's all it is. And that's what he's asking for. So that will happen this year. You will see that at the end of the year, you will see something with it for, for you guys to make a motion to transfer that surplus funds. Perfect. Yeah, I know that's uh, uh, the only question to have. Okay, any more questions? Mr. Uh, Howell, one more in regards to the extended safe topic sites. Do you think we're, we have some exposure? Two or three, I'm thinking, possibly. Uh, but we have to finish the review. One of the qualifications under that section says that if the site is in productive use, you don't have to recognize any liability for it. So the vast majority of our stuff we're using, so it's not a factor at all. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Thor? No, I just going to say I can move to receive that. Sorry. All those in favor? Information item. Council agenda. Council agenda report dated June sixth. The 
account payable checklist. We need to be public library regular board meeting. I'll make a motion to receive that. Okay. Any discussion? Okay, favor? Carry. Okay, uh, I'm for public input. Isn't that what we're on? Yeah, that's what we're on. Yeah, that's what we're on now. Yeah. Okay, thanks for not correcting me. Okay, I'm going to make a of the 2019 Annual Report and 2018 Financial Report. I will make the recommendation of the Council adopt the 2019 Annual Report and 2018 Financial Report for the District of Chelsea's presented. Sorry. Any discussion? I have to say, I say uh, good, good job, everybody involved in this report, so it looks very good. Any more pats on the back? <laughs> yeah, I would like to give you some pat on the back. Thanks very much for making us look good. Doesn't make much though. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Laura. <laughs> All right, to disposal of the surplus equipment. Computer should get to that. I'll make a recommendation. Call. I'll make that recommendation. Call. Council authorizes administration to dispose of units number 1103 and 1111 and method to maximize the return to the district. I second that. I have a question. Yes, discussion. I was just kind of curious what that would look like. Like disposing of, would you sell it in the paper? Do you send it to an auction? How do you do that? I'm just curious. <laughs> I believe this um, for these two we're talking about sending it to an auction. Um, we've already scheduled to send uh, one other vehicle that had been previously approved for disposal to there, so we might just send all three of them. At least amount of time involved for staff to deal with it as well. Um, there, these two vehicles aren't expected to be big return on on the they are quite old, they've been well used, so. Thank you. Any more discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Carry. Okay. Don't see any reports, new business. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 